Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We are so excited to have you. Uh, we've got three fantastic afternoon high school sessions for you, so we hope that you enjoy them. I am Audrey Harmon. I'm a State Ag in the Classroom Coordinator. And uh, before I turn it over to Emily and Melody, I do want to let everyone know that we um, found out this week we have a new team member. So we have a part-time curriculum coordinator, uh, Ms. Susan Murray, and she is um, going to be updating our lessons and has some experience with middle school and high school, um, especially with science. So uh, we're excited to have her as part of our team and she's on uh, the call today. So uh, we appreciate her and we're glad that she's here. And I'm gonna let the ladies introduce themselves. And good afternoon, I'm Melody Offfield, and this afternoon I'll be monitoring the chat feature. If you have questions about Ag in the Classroom, I'll answer um, those questions on the chat, and I might try to engage you um, asking you some questions. And so if you'll just answer to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see that. I'm mainly saying that to remind myself. Sometimes I forget and just goes to all the panelists and then the other people can't see it. So I hope you have a great afternoon. You're in for a real treat today. We have some great presenters. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emily Agu. I am one of the Ag in the Classroom State Coordinators as well. I uh, want to welcome everyone. I can't believe it's our last set of sessions. Um, that's crazy to me. Five days has actually went pretty fast. So we're so glad that you're joining us this afternoon. I am going to be in charge of the Q&A portion. So if you do have a question for our presenter, uh, if you would please put your question in the Q&A portion uh, rather than the chat. The reason is sometimes those questions can get lost in the chat and we can make sure that they get answered if they're in the Q&A. Thank you so much and hope you enjoy. Thanks ladies and I want to introduce you to Tammy Will. She is the high school chemistry and physical science teacher at Morrison as well as the eighth grade science teacher and the STEM teacher. And she's currently also the 2020 Oklahoma Ag in the Classroom Teacher of the Year. So Tammy, we are pleased to have you. And I'm gonna go ahead and start your poll as you are introducing yourself. Hey, thank you, Audrey. Uh, glad to be back today. Uh, as she said that uh, I am a high school science and an eighth grade science teacher and I um, enjoy my job as a science teacher. I, um, I love middle school kids. I love high school kids. I enjoy agriculture. I actually have uh, an undergraduate degree in animal science before I became uh, an educator. And so agriculture is just part of who I am. Uh, I will show you in a minute my family and kind of what we do uh, on our farm. So um, I am happy to be here and ready to go. And if you are not seeing the poll uh, on your screen, sometimes there's a green button at the top that says poll um, and you have to click that to get it opened. We have just um, a few more people needing to vote. So I wanna make sure that everyone sees it and gets a chance to participate. All right, and I am gonna go ahead and close it out. I'm gonna give you a countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. Did anyone else watch the uh, space launch this morning? That was exciting. I know Tammy did. <laughs> sure did. Okay, Tammy, here's the result. Okay, awesome. Well, I'm glad to have everyone. Looks like I have some uh, teachers that teach some chemistry. That's awesome. Um, I teach so many different levels here at Morrison. So I teach a little bit of everything. So we're gonna talk about some soil chemistry today. Um, so I will start with my slideshow so you we can have some good um, visuals to look at. So Audrey, am I ready to go? You should be all set. Okay. Let me make sure I have my sound on. Okay. 
Okay, so today we're going to talk a little bit about chemistry in soil and um, that is not something that a lot of curriculums include, but it's amazing how many different things that you can teach um, with chemistry and adding in soil, which also brings in agriculture. Uh, so whether your students are from the uh, ag world, whether they just live in um, a uh, suburban area or whether they live in town, they can all relate to soil. So I have a um, formula at the top of this slide and in person. Tammy, when I I'm sorry, we're not seeing your slide. Oh, goodness. Okay, hold on. You might have to at the bottom click share, like once you've selected your desktop. Gotcha. Okay, try now. There you go. Awesome. Okay, great. So, um, as I was saying, there's lots of opportunities that you can get some agriculture by talking about uh, soil and chemistry. I have, uh, in person when I do this workshop, I, I do a lot of interaction and questioning. It's a little bit different doing distance learning, but I often ask if uh, anyone knows what this formula is. Um, and it's okay if you don't. It's just something that's very um, important to our soil. We're gonna be talking about a lot of hydrogen today and a lot of carbon today, but this is actually a carbonic acid molecule. And so underneath the soil, uh, you'll have the pockets of carbon dioxide. And when it rains, then it combines with the carbon dioxide and it creates carbonic acid, which is really interesting because we think about rain hitting the soil, but we don't think a lot about what it's interacting with other than we know it goes down for the particle size. So as we move on, we'll talk more about uh, the soil particles and some other concepts. Just quickly, here is a picture of uh, my family. Uh, this is my husband and I's farm. He is a full-time farmer, so he is one of my biggest collaborators when I go to teach um, concepts uh, on uh, chemistry or any type of science concept that involves farming. Um, that pictures a few years ago because my daughter here is now teaching in her third year. So it's hard to get the family together. A little bit of background. We raise cattle. We raise uh, soybeans. We raise wheat. Uh, we raise corn. Um, I help him as much as I possibly can around teaching. Summer is very busy uh, during wheat harvest. Also, right after that becomes hay season. This picture on the top left is me um, swathing alfalfa hay so we can get it in the barn. It's been a really wet month this month, which is good in a lot of ways, but it's been tough on hay season. The bottom right picture is uh, a picture of my chemistry kids a few years ago. Um, we've become known as the class that sets off the fire alarm. So this is us standing outside uh, after they had been doing a lab and it was pretty funny to watch them run out of the lab but they hadn't turned off their Bunsen burners yet so we had a lesson in that when we got back inside. The lesson that I prepared uh, covers uh, a middle school and a high school uh, standard from our uh, Oklahoma OAS standards. Um, it is a three-dimensional standard where we're talking about using and analyze, using models and analyzing, interpreting data. We definitely talk about chemical reactions, uh, energy and chemical processes. Our cross-cutting concepts uh, involve the energy and matter and cause and effect. So if you're looking to try to uh, match this up with a standard that you teach, Here's the ones that this one will for sure cover. So 
I am going to attempt to do a Jamboard. And I don't know if you are familiar with Jamboard or not, but what I want, what I want to do is I wanna use this picture here to go to the Jamboard. That'd be fine. Okay, so here's what Jamboard looks like. Audrey, did we decide we are gonna put that link in the chat for them to go to this? Yes, ma'am, I just added it. So everyone should be able to see it in your chat okay, and awesome. it is hyperlinked for you. So if you haven't used Jamboard before, it's fairly new to me and I'm loving it. Um, basically in a classroom, I would be talking to the kids, put this up on the whiteboard. I would physically ask them, you know, what do you think that's causing this wheat field to look like this? And then I would have them think for a few minutes, turn and talk to a partner, get some more ideas, and then maybe collaborate with a whole table group. And then we would discuss what we're thinking. Instead, we're gonna use a Jamboard today. So right here where my pointer is, is a sticky note. And you can choose your color if you, if you don't like the color that it's on. And then you can come in here and you can type, um, I think, it looks like too much rain. That's just an example. And when you save your sticky note, it posts it on the Jamboard. So what I would like you guys to do is I would like you to go to the Jamboard on the link that Audrey has put in the chat and come into this, we're on page one up here at the top and come in and create your sticky note and pop it in on this Jamboard. Tammy, it's yes. telling us all that we need to have access, that we need to request access. So on your sharing. Let me, uh, okay, so here's a copy link. Let me see if I can, is that the link that you put in the chat? Um, I can't see it. I can't see the link. I can just see that it's, I think you might need to change where it says down there at the bottom of your get link change to anyone with this link. Um, you may need to click on that. That right there. Yes. So anybody can view it. Uh, okay. It. So you may have to change that they can edit. There we go. I see someone popped on. Okay, great, that's working now. While you're doing your sticky note, there's some other um, options over on the left. You, uh, if you're drawing with a pen, which we don't really need to do that today, but you can, uh, then you can come over here and, and draw something. If you want to erase something, then you take your eraser and erase it. You can also insert a picture here, or I can click on the laser and I can talk about this picture. So this wheat field, as you can see over here, it looks different than it looks right here. So what I would do is ask my students um, to- Tammy, I'm gonna interrupt you one more time, I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay, we can all view it, but I think no one's able to do the um, sticky notes. We have to be able to edit, I believe. So back on your share. Okay. Okay, so on my share. Um, if, yes, so click the button that she had you click earlier. And then where it says viewer, I think you need to change that to editor. And then I think we should all be able to do it. Okay, great. Try that. Is it working now, Audrey? 
see. Yes, it is. So they might need to refresh their page. I just did mine and okay. I refreshed my page and then the sticky notes pop up on this side. So um, you should be able to, to see um, them. Yes. participate now. Nice. This is great. I'm, I'm excited that it worked. Nice. Me too. I've only been the participant side, so I haven't uh, actually done it like we had talked about earlier. This is cool. So if you're doing a distance learning uh, lesson at home, or if you're like us and we may possibly be at some time at school, but um, our kids are not going to be at school, this is a way that you can at least uh, ask questions, see uh, what they're thinking. Um, the interesting thing about this is they won't have their classmates sitting next to them and they're not going to be discussing it. So uh, if, they're, if you're doing a distance learning where they're all at home or some of them are at home, it just gets them involved and engaged. So I'm looking at uh, not enough rain or seed, uh, could be getting too much water. Oh, here's a good one. Wheat might be planted too deep. Um, someone else said, looks like nitrogen fertilizer was not applied in this area. Uh, standing water killed the roots. Uh, someone's driven over the field and has compacted the soil. That's another good one. Uh, these are all great. So this is a really neat way to figure out what everyone's thinking. Um, Poor seed placement, soil is lacking nutrients, uh, low pH. Those are all great answers. And that would also give you an idea of what your students know. So like here at Morrison, even though we are a small rural school, it doesn't mean that my kids always know uh, a lot about agriculture. They see it, but they don't, if they're not directly involved with it, then they don't really understand a lot of concepts. And I always think, well, they're from, they're from Morrison. They'll know this, and I'm so surprised that they don't. Okay, so I'm going to go on to the next one. And here's a second one. If you could do the same thing, pop in on a sticky note. What do you think is going on in this cornfield? So you can grab a sticky note and if you're having a hard time finding it at the top of your screen um, there's a a place that says one, two, and three to show the frames with arrows. So you might need to progress yours to the next page so that it matches Tammy's. It's right there. Above that. These are great. These are excellent, excellent thoughts. Some of the things I, I don't know if if my students would come up with, depending on what level I do this with. Um, bad seeds, storm damage, that's one I hadn't thought of. Standing water, poor seed germination, um, fertilization, not enough water, skip planting. Those are all really, really good. Okay, so um, 
the first one on the wheat field was actually, sometimes I forget to tell what these are because the wheat field is not actually our wheat field, but it was, um, it was a problem with nitrogen. And so that was a picture that I borrowed that it was not our wheat field. Uh, this is actually our corn field and uh, took this a few years back when we had so much rain that it was flooding and it wiped out several areas because this is near a, a big creek here around Morrison. And it just, it just flooded out so much of our cornfield. It was really sad. I, I felt really, really bad for my husband who worked so hard. So a lot of different ideas. So you could build on those different ideas, find out what your kids know, um, and then see what's going on as far as what they're thinking. And then you can maybe incorporate some other concepts as you're teaching. So I'm gonna go back to um, the next slide here. Oops. Okay, so this is a copy of the reading page out of the Ag in the Classroom lesson. Uh, this lesson is called Bubbles in Cabbage Juice. Uh, I've taught it several times in my class. It's a very interactive lesson. Um, the reading portion here is something that um, it's hard to get kids just to read because especially my eighth graders, they always want me to tell them the answers. So I introduced this a few years ago and I told them when I walked in and, and again, as a teacher, we all know you've got to know your students. You got to know how to handle this, but I told them that we are going to cuss their reading today. I had a lot of different looks at me from my students but this is a reading strategy. Uh, I'm not an English teacher, but this is one reading strategy I was familiar with from several years ago. Um, and it stands for circle, underline, and star. But my kids' eyes flew wide open when I told them what we are going to do. So what I would have them do in class, and it would be very easy to do as a distance learner, but I would have them read this article and uh, then I would have them cuss the reading. So they circle words that they, oops, let me go back. They would circle words that uh, they do not know. They would star any words that are the main ideas and then they would find evidence to that main idea to back up that idea. So let's go back to the Jamboard. And I may have to share this one too, Audrey. So let me know if it's not working. Or actually, we don't need to share it. I, I went ahead and highlighted one so you can just see an example of what, what your students might give you. But if you're doing this distance learning and you're using this Jamboard uh, application, um, you can share this. And as they read, so I went and I circled organic matter. I can see that being an, an, an idea or a word that is not, they may have heard it, but they may not really know what it is. Um, and then I put a star by carbon is present in organic matter. And then I found out I wasn't a very good underliner. So it's really hard for me to underline. Um, but I did the best I could. So I underlined over here uh, a couple of things that back up, a couple of pieces of evidence that back up the, that carbon is present in all organic matter. So whoever is circling and I, here. I was just going to say, I just circled the photosynthesis. So it's the same process as earlier. Um, just change to that next slide and then your students would be able to interact with you and you can see how um, that lent itself to being able to collaborate even um, when we're not together. Very good. I was wondering who that was because you're a very good circler. It's like, I don't know if I'm just picky, but I start to circle and go, ooh, I got more than that. 
Maybe it's because so, I taught kindergarten. I can draw circles, but I can't teach chemistry. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, it's, it's really a cool little application on Google if you have Google. Um, and so this is something I thought, well, I could use this to collaborate with a lot of my classes, uh, sharing things out, having them look at it, uh, go through. Um, so if they're reading something, uh, you want to figure out what they know or what they uh, can do uh, with the information, you can at least kind of get an idea of what, that, what they're thinking and what they know about that article. Um, like I said earlier, I was always thinking that my kids here at Morrison knew so much, but I'm always surprised when we start talking about any kind of agriculture concept, how they're looking at me with that blank stare going, oh, okay. So I try not to ever assume anymore, so we just dive into it. So back to our slides. Um, great tool to use for collaboration. So the next slide I have here is um, a soil chemistry slide. It is not my slide. Um, it is, here's the reference at the bottom, but it's a really cool slide because it, it it gives you an overall idea of what's going on in the soil. So one of the terms we talk about is macronutrients and micronutrients. And I always tell my students, especially my higher level students, I may not go over this with my eighth graders, but I would with my chemistry class. Um, we talk about um, the difference in those and what are they and uh, what's an example. Uh, a macronutrient being more like your organic molecules or energy, your, carbohydrate, your carbohydrates, your proteins, which are really big molecules, uh, as opposed to most of the ones we talk about in my chemistry class. Um, also, the micronutrients um, are more like the elements, calcium, sulfur, manganese, phosphorus, those types of uh, molecules. So uh, the one thing this is showing is another concept that we talk about in high school chemistry is disassociation in a reaction. And so, and we also of course talk about bonding. So what this is showing is it's showing the soil particles and the fact that the, the charge of the soil is sitting right on top and that there is a, a concept called a cationic exchange capacity. And that is where when you've got these hydrogen ions in the soil that they will exchange with another um, element to exchange and it binds these elements to the soil. So real life application, um, I listen to my husband, I listen to other people talk about, other farming families talk about, uh, well, we need to do this or we lack this in our, in our farm. Um, I usually bring in with my students, if you drive down one of the roads here in around Morrison that's a farm and you see a big pile of white stuff, do you know what that is? And sometimes I'll get a, a maybe two or three kids that do know what that is that, that, and what it's for, but they may not understand the chemistry behind it. So talking about the uh, cationic exchange capacity, it's an inherent soil characteristic. Um, you can't really alter that capacity, in, but what it does is it has the ability to hold on to the essential elements. So if you may, think about the soil at the, on the surface of the soil, there's a negative charge, and then your, it's holding on to the nutrients such as the calcium, the sulfur, the magnesium, uh, and it's holding on to that so that it binds it to the soil so the plants can get use of that. Um, another thing that it also does is, a, is the cation exchange capacity will uh, buffer against acidity which is something I learned when I started doing this. Um, a very intricate 
diagram, fairly high level. Like I said, I probably wouldn't use it with my eighth graders. Um, talking about bonding, my chemistry kids, we go through all the different types of bonds and um, they know that hydrogen bonds, by the end of the year, they will know that hydrogen bonds are the weakest. So when we're talking about bonding with an hydrogen ion, it's weakly bound to these elements up here, or it might be more strongly bonded to these elements here based on a trend on the periodic table uh, that we call electron affinity. So some of those things are too high level for the younger students, but you can really get into some good chemistry concepts that you're teaching already to a high school chemistry class. So this is a, a, a really neat diagram to uh, go over with them. So this next slide, I have a, um, a little, it's about a two or three minute uh, video from YouTube that we're gonna watch. And it really shows you uh, the layers of the soil and what is actually going on in the soil. I often um, address my younger kids, we do some soil conservation um, competitions, we do some essays, we do things like that. And they always love watching these videos because it's, we think we know what goes on in the soil, but actually all the microorganisms that are in the soil, they are amazed by the time we get through talking about that. So I'm gonna go ahead and start this. And Audrey, let me know if the sound's not going, please. If there's sound, we're not hearing it. Not hearing it? No. Okay, let me find my sound. On your original share screen, uh, make sure that you clicked the share your computer sound and optimize for video. Hope that might be it. There it is. Let's try again. You probably yeah, imagine the soil carbon as individual atoms either laying or bouncing around the soil. And nothing could be further from the truth. I met with Dr. Will Brenton, who was able to give us a more holistic picture of the subject. I tell people there's no such thing in soil as C, carbon. It doesn't exist as carbon. It exists as organic matter, from living, once living material, detritus that's decomposing. And you can't see it here, but there's humus all through here that has carbon in it. 50% of humus is carbon. The rest is hydrogen, oxygen, and some minerals, nitrogen in particular, and then phosphorus and a little sulfur, bound up in this complex molecule. But here's what I'm saying about carbon. It's really, the, you have to see it in the active sense of being carbon dioxide. Well, when, when I say carbon dioxide, you say, oh, there's CO2 in the air, and that's what all the climate change discussion is about. But these soils are producing CO2 from the carbon. How, it's not a chemical reaction. It's a biological process. Microorganisms are feeding on this organic matter right here and turning it into nutrients for the body and releasing the C as CO2 which is coming up here, diffusing up through the soil. The beauty of the CO2 relationship is that, what's the primary requirement of a growing plant that absorbs sunlight? It's gonna be carbon, carbon dioxide. That's correct. Without the carbon dioxide, no sugars are formed and the whole infrastructure of plant metabolism doesn't happen. So we naively think, oh, plants are just getting the CO2 from the air. But if you think dynamically, the CO2 is coming from the soil. And this is a great canopy here to show it. These are rich soils. There's a high activity. We've measured the respiration rate in the soil. We can quantify that now as CO2 per acre. That's what's getting really exciting. This plant canopy has a very high CO2 demand during full growth, probably in the order of 50 to 100 pounds of CO2 per day while these radish plants are at full growth. Where is the CO2 coming from? 
Well, isn't it convenient that's being produced right here in the soil? And it's bubbling up out of the soil, so to speak, by capillary and diffusion, going past the water molecules and soil particles, and the plant leaves are grabbing it and recycling it immediately. So the humus it was humus one minute, next hour it's CO2, another hour later it synthesized sugar in the plants and it's on its way back down into the soil. Carbon dioxide requirements can be quantified and I believe we will find that there's evidence that canopies during full growth are CO2 limited and what that means is photosynthesis saturates out early so the plant can't take up nitrogen if the CO2 isn't there commensurate to meet the requirement of the metabolism because taking up nutrients is a metabolically depleting process. It's not a passive process. So it's a whole system. And I think as we begin to quantify CO2, we're going to have some astonishing discoveries here in terms of crop yield limitations. And then we're going to change our farming practices to be carbon oriented. Because it's not just NPK, it's CNPK. That's the difference. Switching back, that link is in your files, correct? Uh, yes, I believe so. We can double check and make sure it is. Okay, they're wanting to make sure that it is, so um, okay. we'll, we'll make sure before we we'll send it out, check. we'll make sure that it is. Okay, great. Okay, so a lot of information about carbon, um, and then so we talk about all the things that. Um, that go into soil and we look about we look at the microorganisms how carbon affects it and we're all probably familiar with the carbon cycle we're going to talk about that in a minute but something that i really do um, get to talk to my younger students about is uh, ph and um, the back to the cation exchange capacity it actually uh, depends on the ph of the soil and I thought that was very interesting when I learned that. Um, so most of my students will know the scale or they've heard of it or they have a pool or a hot tub or they've been to the uh, locals uh, community pool. And so we just go over and we talk about the numerical values. Um, with my older kids, I might talk about it being a, 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 a logarithmic, arithmetic, uh, log number as it's times 10 for each one. It's not just one, two, three. Um, so we talk about things that they're familiar with. Uh, a lot of kids will know battery acid is, is obviously the name says it's an acid. The one thing they don't know is milk of magnesia. I found that out. Um, but they do know bleach. And so we talk about different things they know and how this still works. Um, does, and then I would ask them also if they know what pH stands for. And not very often do I get a student who actually knows what uh, the P and the H stands for in pH. They might know what it is, what it is, and they might know uh, what it means. So uh, pH stands for potential hydrogen. And we talk about that in terms of the chemistry. Um, so we reinforce the numbers, what they mean. So as we do our experiment, they will be uh, uh, having that on their mind because our experiment's gonna deal with pH. Um, so then we go into talking about, uh, well, what does that mean for farming? What does that mean for gardeners? What does that mean for people who utilize the soil? Um, I had, uh, with permission, borrowed this map about three years ago uh, from a professor at OSU, and he sent this to me, and this is actually real-time data, and we talk about that in class. This is the average pH values of the counties in our state. Um, so they actually did this as a, a research uh, 
part of a research position there at OSU uh, in the agronomy department. And uh, this is the map that they came out with. And we talk a lot about, so my, my kids that have a little experience will talk and say, well, they, they've seen different colors of soil or they've seen, uh, or they know someone who maybe lives out here in the panhandle or in far west Oklahoma uh, versus where we live. So we're up here. And um, so Oklahoma overall has a lot of acidic soil. And another thing we got to keep in mind, and we discussed this too, because I like to talk about research in my class, is we discuss that these are actual numbers, but they're also from not everyone in that county. So while it gives us a snapshot of what pH values are across our state, it's not going to be all inclusive because it would have been um, more of a, yes, I will volunteer to take a soil sample and test and send you my numbers type thing. So not everyone has sent those numbers in. So we talk about how re real research works and how it can be limiting or how, how it can represent what we're looking at. So the next table takes us to um, another research uh, paper that I had pulled this from. And so what's really interesting about this is I began to look at this for the first time as my husband and I talk a lot at night when I'm into my chemistry class because I'm always wanting to know what's the real application of what I'm teaching in my class. And in turn, I've learned that he knows what application to use, but he doesn't know the chemistry. And so we have a lot of deep discussions at our house but we grow, like I said before, we grow wheat, corn, uh, alfalfa, soybeans, and of course we have cattle. But this is some relative average yields of bushels per acre based on pH values. So I thought this was very uh, applicable to what we're doing. And so if you look at alfalfa, so that's one crop that we grow. Let's look at 5.7 pH and alfalfa, this is your yield, the 40, about 42. If it was a pH of a little bit higher, look at the jump in what could be possibly grown. Of course, we're also looking at other factors, but as we know experimentally, and we talk about this, that even though this was a number here, it could vary. And also you've got to have all your other environmental factors going as well such as rain and, and sun and all that balance. So we're assuming uh, some of those that are all balanced, that if you can grow only 42 in a pH of 5.7, what would it look like at a 6.8? So let's also look at our wheat. We have an 89 bushel average at a 5.7, but if we jumped it up to, so looking at those two, which is two crops that we grow and we rotate our crops, those two would definitely both be able to be grown one after the other as we're rotating because of look at the pH. And then we talk about um, actual sending in your, your um, soil samples. And we do that at our house. We do that every year. We pull samples from our uh, fields and look at all the different things, not just pH, but that gives you an idea of what's going on in your field so you can make some intelligent decisions on, you know, how to grow what crop after another, what works best, uh, what doesn't work. Um, so, and this is not all inclusive, but this gives you an idea of something you can talk about to your kids that if you've got really low acid soil, over here, you're not gonna get very much corn and we don't grow barley, but uh, that wouldn't work either. That sure wouldn't work if we tried to grow alfalfa in a field with a 4.7 pH. So all of these factors come into play and we get to discuss that in class as well. Tammy, you have about six minutes left. I know you wanted to get to the lab. Okay, great, thanks Audrey. Um, so here's, uh, I'll let you look at this one later, but this is basically evidence of organic matter. Um, I know we've all seen different colored soils, so this will give you an idea of what that color represents. Um, I just talked about soil testing. Um, one of the things I actually have, there's another lesson that I'm 
putting in the folder that Audrey will have for you. Uh, I actually took my kids out and pulled soil samples on our farm. I had two classes and I, they were big classes. And so I had kids all over our farm that day and uh, they were pulling core samples like the one you see in the picture. Uh, so they were all over because we wanted samples from different areas because you don't want to just pull one from one area. So you get all those samples, you mix them together so you can kind of get an overall idea of what your field looks like. Um, we talk a lot about no-till farming um, and what uh, herbicides, what we do with those. Um, so we're, we, we look at what herbicides we need to get rid of our broadleafs and our grasses before we no-till farm. Um, in and depending on what crop came before that will help our decision in that. Also back to the pH in our soil, um, the, the pile of um, white stuff that my students always go, yeah, I've seen that, what is that? So it's usually lime that's sitting uh, out in the field. Uh, gypsum is the one that you add to, uh, to to drop your pH, but we don't do a lot of that around here because our soil is typically more acidic than it is basic. So we're usually trying to raise our uh, pH levels in our fields. So the last slide I have is uh, a carbon cycle, and I'm sure this is not something new to you, but something you can talk to your students about depending on what level you're, you're talking about. Um, ways to increase organic matter. That's been a very hot topic in farming in the last several years. My husband was probably one of the first people that started no-till farming about eight to 10 years ago. Uh, a lot of people have already done that, have already implemented the practice of crop rotation. Managing trees is another one that uh, sometimes students don't think about. Uh, grazing management, we have implemented some new grazing management at our house in the last couple of years, which is very different than what we've done in the past. Um, and looking at adding more organic matter, uh, we uh, are doing a lot of cover crop um, growing, so that puts a lot of organic matter back into the soil before we plant our crap, crop. So the um, I know there's some people around close to us that do some manure spreading uh, that also helps add to your organic matter. So um, with that, I'm going to exit out of my Audrey, you'll have to give me some guidance and let me know if y'all can see yeah. this. Yes, we can. But awesome. actually, will you um, click the red stop sharing your screen and then that'll make that larger because right now, there you go. Oh, there we go. Okay. I was wondering how it's so small. Okay, so there are two parts of experiments in the Ag in the Classroom Bubbles and Cabbage Juice. Uh, I'm only going to do the second part for time. Um, the first part, uh, as you uh, go down through the lesson, it puts them in groups and you, they do their own little experiment and then you get, you get to collaborate uh, with what's going on in each one. I already have my cabbage juice made and I also have a, a note on that too, how to do that fairly quick. Um, there's a couple of ways you can do it. I do it differently in honors chem than I would do it in eighth grade. So I have it in my picture. And so in one cup I have, I just poured in is baking soda and that's like um, a control. So that's what I'm gonna compare these three soil samples. This is soil that um, my um, husband actually went and got for me. He's really good about pulling samples or, or pulling um, shovels of soil out for me to bring to my class. The other control, it's hard to see, and I don't know if I move it back, if it's easier to see, maybe. So the other control is just white vinegar. And while the video was going, I poured the white vinegar in. So as we put our cabbage juice into the controls, you can see the color is very blue, almost kind of a turquoise color. 
And then as I put my indicator in the vinegar, it is going to be a real bright pink. So this is what they're comparing to. So then I would have them take their indicator. And of course, we've already talked about indicator and what that means. Oops, I almost got too much there. I'm trying to put on this soil, I'm trying to get a little bit of liquid on the top so you can see the color. Well, I didn't mean to put them in order. So what they would do is they would put, here's sample three. If you can see the color very well, but it is kind of a green color. And the one here in the middle, sample one, is the same color as the indicator, the cabbage juice. Sample two is kind of purple, but it's got a little bit of a pink tone to it. So what you would have them do is once they take their soil samples and get their indicator of their pH, and we would talk about the pH and we would talk about uh, the scale and the colors that match that, that is all in the information that you will get in the folder. So they will then arrange them based on what are they close to. So that gives them a hands-on idea of what pH really looks like using a, a um, garden crop called red cabbage. Thanks, Tammy. I'm glad we made it to that point that you could show that. That was great. Um, we unfortunately are out of time, so I need to close out. Does anyone have any last minute questions for Tammy before I close this one out to start the next session? Um, Melody said she may have liked chemistry in high school if she'd had you as a teacher. I would agree with that one. All right, well, I'm gonna close out this session. Thanks so much, Tammy. Everyone stick around and join us for the next one. Thanks, guys. <laughs>